Good afternoon. How are y'all doing? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay, I think everybody already knows who the next speaker is going to be. Our wonderful friend, Doc Marquis. Yeah. Yeah. I've got to tell you this. He has got a message that he's going to be presenting here for the very first time. He said, I want to be able to present it on the Prophecy in the News Conference. So what you're going to hear, nobody else has heard before. So please, let's bring up Doc Marquis. Come here, come here. Oh, wonderful lady. Can everyone hear me? Oh, good. How's everyone enjoying the conference so far? Good. Oh, Linda. Linda, listen to this. Oh, no. Have a seat. Make yourself comfy. As the story goes, Dr. Jerry Farwell, Pat Robinson, and Dr. J.R. Church ended up at the pearly gates at the same time. How it happened? I don't know. I wasn't there. It happened. Well, anyways, so they wait for Peter to come greet them, usher them in and everything. Peter finally makes it there, and he goes, can I help you? And they look at him and goes, well, yeah, we'd like to come in. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. We can't let you in. We're full. You'll have to go to the other place. So they're standing there, who knows how long in eternity, arguing the point. Finally, they give up, and they go to the other place. Well, a year later, Satan appears at the pearly gate, and he's just banging at the door going, Peter, Peter, get over here. Well, Peter shows up at the pearly gate, and he goes, what do you want? He goes, those three you just sent me? He goes, yeah, get them out of there. And he goes, what's the problem? That Robinson, that Robinson character has healed everyone in the entire place. That Farwell character has raised up enough money to air condition the entire place. And that Dr. J.R. Church character has saved everyone in the entire place. <laughs> so if you want to know what's going on in the afterlife... Well, anyways, this is going to be, it's always, it's always tough to say, this is the last presentation I'll be doing for this time. Anyways, this one is really a good one. I know I wrote it. <laughs> no, no. We are going to start um, going through past events in the Olympic Games. Now, some people, finally, since 2012, are beginning to catch on. Something's going on here. Well, it didn't start at 2012. What we have to do first, we've got to go into the past vicariously speaking. And I'm going to bring you up to show you something that most of you have never seen before so that we can understand what's going on now. Because remember, 2016 is rolling around the next Olympic Games. Here we have um, a relief of Hercules. According to the ancient stories in, um, written by the Greek poets and such, Hercules had, created tw um, had to finish 12 labors. At the end of those labors, he decided to honor his father, Zeus, um, um, by creating an athletic event to honor the strength and glory of the gods and everything. And thus we came up, according to the legends now, the Olympic Games. And here we have an um, ancient representation of Olympia in Athens where the Olympic Games would have been held first in 776 B.C. So you can tell this stuff is almost as old as I am. Well, anyways, the original Olympic Games consisted of foot races, javelin tosses, you know how they threw the discus and everything? Oh my goodness, I'd kill myself on that one alone. I'd probably chop my own head off. And of course, various contests of strength. And all this was to um, honor the pagan gods. Now, when we look at 
the actual games themselves. It actually consisted of two um, events. First, there was the games themselves. Then the second was a religious festival known as the Eleusinian Festival. It was a very, very occultic um, ritual that went on. Anyways, here we have Theodosius I. He was the emperor of Rome. He, re he reigned from 346 to 395 AD. Now, he stopped the Olympic Games from continuing because he was trying to push um, the new religion, which was not Christianity, it was, but the competition, if you want to call it that, was Catholicism. That's what Theodosius was in. He was not a Christian, neither was Constantine, the first historical pope, which was in 313 AD. No, they were Catholics, and I think we all know there's a world of difference. Now, here we have Phidias, who was writing about these events, but Phidias um, came up with the structure that's become known as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This is known as the Sanctuary of Zeus. Now, if you look towards the bottom middle of it, you'll see a couple of, well, it looks like very small people. Well, that's because the actual statue of Zeus within this ancient structure, if the writings are correct, was more than 40 feet in height. It was made out of marble and covered in gold. Yeah. The games lasted, if you remember, as I said, from 776 um, to the time of Fidai, I mean, to Theodosius I, almost a thousand years. And so, eventually, these great structures were built in Olympia to honor these pagan gods. Here we have Strabo, the Greek historian. He wrote of the games, the glory of the temple persisted on account of the festival assembly and of the Olympian games, in which the prize was a crown in which was regarded as sacred, the greatest games of the world. The temple was adorned by its numerous offerings, which were dedicated there from all parts of Greece. Everyone in the Greco Empire just flocked to these games. And literally, you know, remember, you know, this was a major event. So you see these temples being built, the gods are being honored. And during um, the games themselves, they would stop it and have these sacrifices being performed, not human. They would bring out a hundred oxen and slay them to honor Zeus. Yeah. Here we have a reconstruction of the actual sanctuary of Zeus itself. This thing was so magnificent. It was absolutely breathtaking. Now, when it's interesting, if you go to your Bible... Acts chapter 14, verses 11 through 13, it says, And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. You see, Paul was just, you know, minding his own business, healing, preaching, all this, you know, maybe raising a couple of dead people. The people saw this. My goodness, this is what the gods do. This is what they're talking about in, in the Bible. Remember um, when they were having the, that fit over great is the temple, I mean, great is the goddess Diana? Remember that one? Yeah. It goes on. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. That's how you honor the gods. You slay the oxen, bring out the reeds, lay treasure, bow down, light the incense, everything. They were considered gods. Of course, Paul straightened them up very quickly about that one. But just to let you know, this stuff is in the Bible if you look carefully enough. <clears throat> now, the revival of the Olympic Games 
didn't start, um, remember, it, start, it stopped in the fourth century because of Theodosius. But over the centuries, it had been, well, I should say there was attempts to revive it. We had first what was known as the Cotswold Game. If you look, there's an actual poster or one of those notices of the ancient Cotswold Games themselves. Now, the games um, that was done in England at this time, these were basic... Um, country sports, you know, like riding horses, things like that. That's what the Cotswold Games were all about. It was an early beginning. Now, the French Olympic Games, look at the date carefully. 1796 through 1798. Why did it last only two years? <laughs> I mean, ladies and gentlemen, this is an easy one. Let's... <laughs> In 1798, the um, Illuminati started the Great French Revolution. You know, Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette. You know, that was it. So, unfortunately, <laughs> the French games didn't last long. Next one. Well, let's go to the Wenlock games. Um, if you take a look at the date at the bottom in Latin, 1850. Can you see that, ladies and gentlemen? Can you see that, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. You want me to get desperate, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> no, 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 no. Never mess around with a high school teacher. No. Next one. Um, the gentleman on your left, Dr. William Penny Brooks. In 1850, he started what was known as the Wenlit Games in much Wenlock in Swapshire, England. Trust me, I haven't been to Shropshire in decades, but it's there, I know. But anyway, he eventually formed, about 10 years later, what was known as the Wenlock Olympic Society. Eventually, you're going to see how this progresses. Let's get to the next one. Now, look at that medal. Take a look at the center. That is the goddess of victory known as Nike. Remember this, Nike. Oh, yeah, you're getting it. Yeah, that's exactly where you're getting it from. Okay? Let's get to the next one. Here are some of the Olympic champions. I know, it, it looks kind of funny, you know, in that sepia tone and everything. Um, I like the middle one where the guy got the medal for bicycling. bicycling. You know? I couldn't get on that thing without breaking my neck. I am not kidding. Now, the guy on your right, his Olympic prize, I was just telling this to Michael, was a silver inkwell. Yeah, that's what he got for the prize. Yeah, you won. Here's your inkwell. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what can I say, you know? But next one. <laughs> the Liverpool game. Um, this one is where they really first began to have, shall we say, an international flavor about it because they'd invite other countries um, um, throughout Europe to part, um, partake of the games, but women were still not allowed. You see, in the original Olympic Games, women were forbidden to um, participate. Now, what did happen how many of you have seen any of the ancient vases or reliefs or fresco where you see Olympic champions doing whatever and they're in the buff? How many of you have seen things like that? Well, you see, the reason that happened was because a number of females decided that they were going to try to get into the Olympic Games anyways. And, you know, they got away with it for a little while, but, you know, well, they were caught, so they decided that from there on in, the athletes were going to have to um, not only be medically examined, but perform certain things in the buff. You can't make this stuff up. That's just the way they did it. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> Anyways, let's look at the Greek and Ottoman Empire. On your left is Evangelos Zapas, and on your right was the, um, the king of Greece. That was Otto. Um, Zapas had um, petition. Um, the Greco um, um, king to help him develop 
what we would call the Olympic Games. And so, what eventually did happen? Zapes, in 1859, he was sponsored, he actually sponsored, pay out of his own pocket now. He funded the first Olympic um, Games, which was held in the city square in Athens itself. Um, afterwards, he decided to completely renovate and restore the ancient Panathenaic Stadium so that, you know, it could host this new Olympic game. Let me sh um, show you what this looks like. Here is a very ancient photo um, of the restoration, well, I should say, of what the ancient Panathenaic um, Stadium looked like back in 1859. Let's see what it looks like when it was restored. Oh, first of all, yeah, I forgot. They did build um, another temple to honor um, Athena, the patron goddess of Greece. Oh, yeah. Athens itself was named after um, Athena. And if you look at the statue itself, 40 feet in height, made out of marble, covered in gold. And do you see that statue she's holding in her hand? That's a life-size human being. But that statue, that winged statue, is a Nike. Mm -hmm. Here we have um, Herodotus Atticus. Um, he was the one that had built the original Panathenaic Stadium. Now, this was done back in 320. Remember, this would have been about... 450 years after the games originally started. You know, and remember, as I said, people were flocking from all over Greece to see these events. So, um, Herodot eventually just had a giant stadium built. Now, it was originally, you know, wooden seats and all this, but it was restored in 140 AD. And once the renovation was done, not only was it... Um, the seats made out of marble, but it could fit up to 50,000 people. Yeah, that was considered quite a feat back then. Here is the restoration um, of the Panathenaic Stadium back in 1896. Now, if you looked towards the middle, towards the, um, uh, yeah, about the middle towards the left, you'll see... Um, um, the Acropolis itself. Let's see if we can get a better picture of this. Yeah. You see on um, the temple up there? That's the ancient temple of Athena herself. Yeah. And this is the complete restoration of the front of the ancient Panathenaic Stadium. Yeah. They spent the money well. Now, we're going to take a look at the modern day games, okay? That's just a brief history you needed to know. Because up to this point in 1896, certain things were never there. And I'll show you what I'm talking about in a moment. Here we have Baron Pierre de Coubertin. He was the one that was responsible for really bringing the Olympic Games into what we call the modern days. And that is because he saw and witnessed a number of times the old Wenlock Games. So he formed a committee, and for the first time, they formed what was known as the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and they decided that the very first game should be held where it originated, and that would have been Athens, Greece. Mm -hmm. Now, here's Demetrius Vikolas. He became the first president of the IOC in 1895, though I thought it should have gone to, you know, um, Corbettin. He, he founded it, didn't he? Well, fortunately, next year and for the rest of his days through 1825, Ben Pierre de Corbettin had become the president of the IOC. And here we have a very rare photo of the actual opening ceremony of the 1896 Olympic Games in Athens, Georgia. I mean, Greece. Yeah, Georgia. Here we go. No, yeah, I say that because, you know, I was um, in Tennessee a couple of years ago, and they have an actual reproduction, I mean, full everything, of the 
temple of Ap- uh, Bethina herself. Yeah, yeah. Um, look this up online. Just look up um, um, Temple of Bethina in um, Nashville. Yeah, it's there. Just like um, Stonehenge, you have a, a life-size replica in Washington. You people didn't know this? Oh my goodness! You oh my god! You really got to buy my DVDs. <laughs> but anyways. So here, as you can see, the restoration, if you look to the left and right, where all the people are gathered, I mean, it was brought back to its glory where more than 50,000 people were seated. Next one. Now, this is where we get into the fun part, where the, in, where the Illuminati started to infiltrate the Olympic Games. Everything was hokey-dokey up to 1896, but things were about to change. Who remembers this dictator? Oh, wait a second, we have two dictators, that's right. (laughs) I always get them confused. Yeah, okay. The one with the big mouth, oh, wait a second. (laughs) The one on your left, okay. Was one of the biggest puppets the Illuminati had ever created. You see, Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany, if you remember your history, in 1933. Now, um, about a year later, he was um, um, told that they had, that's your signal, Michael, right, keep going. No, go back. (laughs) Okay. Um, He was told that, okay, we can host the Olympic Games. He wasn't going to go for it. He didn't like the idea. The Illuminati told him to do it anyways. And Joseph Goebbels was going to be one of the main um, players in this because, think about this for a second. Berlin, um, the German people, were a defeated people. After World War I and the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, I mean, they were absolutely decimated as a nation. They were pariah on the face of the earth as a people. They were so impoverished that it took one million Dutchmarks to buy a loaf of bread. That's how bad it was. However, Hitler finally wised up to the idea, whether he liked it or not, um, because this would thrust Nazi Germany into the forefront of the world. Hi, we are a civilized people We are back, we are here to stay. And we're going to show you, we are the superior people. And they were going to do this through the Olympic Games. Now, let's take a look at the lighting of the Olympic torch. Here we have Fritz Schilging lighting the 1936 Olympic bowl. Okay, nothing uncommon there. Now, when we go back to um, Olympia in Greece, this... Um, photo you're looking at, this is the remains of the ancient temple of Hera where the original games were held. Let's keep going. This procession you're looking at right now, the lady in the front would be the high priestess of Hera, and she's leading the Vestal Virgins into the lighting ceremony. Now, by the way, um, This particular um, grouping of photos I'm showing you is from the 1996 opening, okay? Next one. And here we have the Vestal Virgins dancing to honor the gods. Next one. The high priestess then, she will stand, if you look at the the base of her feet, you will see a parabolic um, mirror. She will um, then call upon the ancient gods, especially Apollo. And then, once the um, parabolic mic has um, created a fire, this high priestess of Hera will take a torch and light that um, first torch. She will then, oh, um, take a look around. Um, Look towards your middle left there. You can see crowds of people flocking around. This is a major event, ladies and gentlemen. Thousands and thousands of people, athletes, musicians, are all gathered around to honor the ancient gods 
and to call upon Apollo's blessing for this part of the opening of the Olympic torch ceremony. That's your clue, Michael, thank you. And the priestess of Hera, she will then take the sacred torch and light the very first Olympic torch. Now, let's, let's take a good look at this next one. Here we have the original 1936 German postcard of the Berlin Games. Now, if you look towards the very bottom of that uh, map, you will see where Olympia is. And this, you know, and so they would race from Olympia to Greece, and they followed that red line all the way up to where the 1936 Berlin Games would be held. And here we have, if you look, oh, towards almost the bottom left, you'll see Fritz Schilgen running through the clouds, you know, in Berlin, Germany in 1936. He was then coming down the stairs. Now, remember, the Olympic Games... Um, the people would usually, you know, run down the stairs or it would be, you know, at, you know, regular levels. They'd run into the, the stadium. And in this case, Fritz ran up to the box where Adolf Hitler was located. Afterwards, he would run um, through the crowd and then eventually he made it to the Olympic steps where he'd light the Olympic bowl. Take a look at this next one. You see the bowl itself, 1936. But you see, there's a problem, ladies and gentlemen. We have only looked at, let's think about this for a second, um, an Olympic bowl, a torch, um, some sort of giant marathon race, things like that. Keep that in the forefront of your mind for a second. We're going to look at something else here. Take a look at this ancient um, coastline here. This is ancient Greece itself. Now, this is Marathon Greece as it is today. Now, in the center of this map, can you see where it says um, Athens? You know, a little towards your right, you're going to see the, um, the plains of Marathon. Now, in that area, in 490 B.C., the Persian Empire decided that they were going to attack Greece. Well, what had happened? The Greek army was able to hold them off for a little bit, but they knew that they were going to need their help. So what they did, they sent a man known as Philippides. Go back one, please. And he was to run from the plains of Marathon. Now look all the way to the left, bottom towards the bottom where it says Sparta. He ran from Marathon all the way to Sparta, 150 miles. And he was to deliver a message there. Basically, we need help. The Spartans said they would send their armies, but in a week, because they were in the middle of a, relig a religious holiday, and they had to observe certain things of the gods. Philippides ran all the way back 150 miles back to Marathon. Reported to the captain the news, and, well, the captain decided, well, we're not going to wait. No, keep going. We're not going to wait. So they, the Athenian army decided that they were going to attack the Persian armies on their boats head on. And they literally sent... The Persian fleet running, but the Persians weren't done yet. They were going to go and attack Athens since they were defeated there. So the captain of the commanding armies then, he figured by the way those um, Persian um, boats were leaving, that's exactly what they were going to do. So he sent Philippides one more time running to Athens, and after he turned in the message, he died on the spot. Yeah. That's where you get the marathon race from. Because of events in marathon Greece. And, it, and as the story goes, it was Philippides um, that had run 150 miles one way, 150 miles the other. Then he had to run to Athens. He had a torch. 
supposedly, and he could see at night, and he made it to finally Athens where he told the officials what was going on, and he just died. Yeah. So what does this got to do with the story? Well, if we go by the original um, story, what happened back in 1776 B.C., read along with me. First of all, the original games never had an Olympic bowl. There was no um, marathon race, and there was no Olympic torch. Joseph Goebel, as I stated before, convinced Hitler to do this because, among other things, not only could they demonstrate German superiority over the world, but they would follow the orders of the Illuminati to put in uh, um, elements from the religious practice of um, the Illuminati, which is known as Luciferian witchcraft, and incorporate it into the games. Now, how many of you, um, next one, keep going. Um, remember the invocation to the gods at the Temple of Hera? Okay, let's see this next one. And, of course, there's the Sanctuary of Zeus. This is actually, we're going to get into the story of Prometheus. How many remembers the story of Prometheus? Very few. Well, see, Prometheus was a titan. And according to the ancient Greco stories, he created man out of clay. Well, in order to help, move and uh, build his new creation. He went into the heavens and stole fire from the gods and gave it to mankind. This was um, supposedly hidden occult wisdom and knowledge that they could use to become a civilized people through. Now, as punishment for standing up against the gods doing what he did, Zeus had him chained to a huge boulder, and every day... Um, crows would fly in and eat his liver. Yeah, and every single day, that would happen over and over and over again. That was Zeus's punishment to him. Well, anyways, um, when we look at the religious aspects of this game, well, we now have the Temple of Hera and the Invocation of the Gods, and we're going to find this as we go along. You're going to see we have the story of um, Prometheus, the Olympic torch, um, the cauldron, the, per, um, the pillars of Hercules, so on and so forth. But let's get into this. Here we have the mezzanine goat head. Why do I put that there? You see the um, torch in between his horn? That represents the hidden wisdom and knowledge of the occult world. That's where the torch comes from. This particular rendition was um, um, drawn by Eliphas Levi, who was also a mason. <clears throat> Here we have Prometheus in front of Rockefeller Center. And if you notice in his hand, he's holding um, what's supposed to be fire. Notice the ring around Prometheus has the 12 symbols of the zodiac. Now, the one thing you must know about the Illuminati Anyone in the Illuminati of any prominence, the Illuminati will always, always, always mark their territory. It is sacred to them. That's why in front of Rockefeller Center, they have the person responsible for bringing this hidden knowledge to mankind. But there's also something else there most people don't see. Look at the top of the building, the Tishman building at Rockefeller Center. What are you looking at? Those are 10 foot tall, 666. And at nighttime, they glow in the dark. So everyone can see the Tishman building. Now, the Olympic torch itself is the symbol of um, the story of Prometheus when he stole fire from the gods. That's what you're looking at when you see um, the Olympic torch. Um, next one. We're going to get into the earth goddess now. Who's, I, I, I think all of you people have heard of the earth goddess by now, right? Yeah. Let's hear that a little louder, by the way. Uh, Linda, 
I'm getting desperate here. If they don't start reacting better, you know me. According to the ancient stories, the earth goddess decided to find out why all things she loved died and decayed. So she took a journey into the bowels of the earth through Hades, passed through the gates, and walked up to death itself and demanded to know, why do you take away all those things I love? And death replied, it is not my fault. It's time that does that. And he said, stay with me, and I will teach you all the knowledge and magic you wanted to know. And she said, no, because I don't love you. He said, then you will feel my sting. And he took out a whip, and he beat her. That symbolizes such knowledge comes through a lot of pain, a lot of trials, a lot of tribulations. But in the end, he gave her the knowledge of magic and all the hidden knowledge that she was looking for. And according to the ancient stories in the occult world, and I remember this, um, it is believed she carried a torch to light her way up from the bowels of the earth. And once she brought this torch up, the knowledge and the wisdom she had gained was passed throughout the world. Yeah, it's a very ancient occult story. We got a lot of them in the Illuminati and certain other places, you know. What can I say? You know, but anyway, look at the Olympic cauldron. Notice how in 1996, it wasn't referred to as an Olympic bowl anymore. It is now a cauldron. That's what it's called. I think everyone could guess that one. Why? Yeah. And you see... <clears throat> Whenever the Olympic cauldron is lit, the story of Prometheus comes to pass because the Olympic cauldron represents, again, the flames, the fire that's being shot out to the world of all the ancient occult knowledge and wisdom that was brought up through the earth goddess. Next one. Here we have the Pillars of Hercules. Who's ever heard of that? The Pillars of Hercules? Yeah, let's take a look. In um, 1936 Berlin, you see those pillars there? Those were actually the pillars of Hercules. Now, if you go by the ancient stories, um, look in the center of the map, you will see um, an ancient map in which, in where you see the pillars of Hercules. According to the stories, if you travel far, far enough, if you see that red circle there, that's right um, at the Straits of Gibraltar, um, you have to pass through this part um, between Portugal and such, and if you continue, you will come upon the legendary lost continent of Atlantis. That's what the Greeks actually believed. You go through the Pillars of Hercules, and you come to Atlantis. Now, let's think about Atlantis for a second. They were a superior race, gifted athletes. The city of Atlantis was an advanced city. Atlantis had advanced technology. The citizens of Atlantis were a unified people under one ruler, and they had an incredible wealth of knowledge, power, and money. This was Atlantis. How many of you read the story? Just a couple of people. Are you busy in the Common Core stuff or something? <laughs> yeah, no, read the, read the old stuff, ladies and gentlemen. It's better. Well, anyways, Hitler was going to have Germany looked upon as the new Atlantis, and we're going to find out how. Here we have um, members of the German um, team um, as you well know, they were called the Aryan race, supposedly because, and you just can't make this up, ladies and gentlemen, in the Aldebaran system, that um, galaxy far, far away, and I don't mean Luke Skywalker either, it's just so far out there, that supposedly they were in contact with mediums, psychic mediums, telling them um, that the Aryan people were descended from them. 
You'll find this out in DVDs 9 and 10, trust me. It's a long but interesting story. But anyways, if you look at the, um, towards the bottom, they proved that they were superior athletes according to the um, um, ancient legends because they won 33 gold medals, 26 silver medals, 30 bronze medals for a total of 89 medals. They won more medals than any other nation in the world. They were the superior athletes, according to the stories. Well, look at this um, model here. According to Hitler's plans, he was going to build the world capital of Germania um, in Berlin. Now, if you look at that big domed building towards the top right as you go down um, the main road there, that thing, if I remember, was something like 10 times bigger than the one used um, in, the, um, in the capital. I mean, the architects weren't even sure if that would even stand. It was so massive. But that was, represents um, Hitler's ego. It was going to be bigger than anything that anyone had ever seen before. Now, do they have superior technology? Well, if you folks didn't know this, you're going to find this interesting. It was here that the very first um, television, um, um, what do you call them? Those cameras, thank you, were going to be used. The very first usage was at the 1936 Olympic Games. Look at how long, how big that camera is. Let's go to the next one. Look at this one here on your left. Yeah. 21 cameras were used during the Olympic Games with 28 viewing rooms, if you look at the picture on your um, right. That's a giant screen TV. That over 150,000 viewers could watch. That was a quantum leap in technology back then. But then, according to the Germans, it was going to happen. We are the superior race. We're the New Atlanteans. Well, weren't they a unified people, according to the ancient Atlantic stories? Weren't they a unified people, according to the ancient Atlantic stories? Yeah, yeah. do I have to get desperate here? You don't want to see me do that. Anyways, let's get to the next one. So here is the Olympic Village of 1936. Anyone see anything odd going on here? Go to the next one, Michael. That is the Eye of Lucifer, the oldest symbol in the Illuminati to denote their false god that you find on the back of a dollar bill in other places. Remember how I told you before, the Illuminati always marked their territory. And they did it here. There is, that is the original 1936 postcard of the Olympic Village. Now, let's take a look at the Olympic bell tower. Now, I think you can see that towards the left, the middle. You see that great structure there, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, that's the Olympic bell tower of 1936. And, of course, here's the bell. You can see the um, Nazi warbird there holding the Olympic rings. And if we look at the other side of it, you will see the date 1936 with the swastika, you know, at the bottom of it. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, in the original games... And in, the, and in the modern day one, 1896, these things didn't exist. These are all part and partial of the belief system of the Illuminati. You see, the bell tower was built for a number of reasons. First of all, after Hitler was brought into the stadium and he um, addressed the athletes and all this, he went into the bell tower and he actually called upon the souls of the departed um, soldiers of World War I to possess his athletes and grant them, you know, victory. Now, what is this called in the Bible? Necromancy. 
communication with the dead. And the way you do this, you have to have a bell that can be sounded because it is believed that metaphysical vibrations will be heard by the gods and they will come down and attend to you. And, then, and it should be in a bell tower. The higher, the better. But this is not part of the Olympic Games. It never had been. Again, this was in addition by Hitler. You never had the Olympic torch, but I think you know what it represents now. You never had an Olympic um, cauldron. Well, it's a, a bowl, but now it's a cauldron. You never had that marathon runner and all the hundreds of runners that will take this hidden occult knowledge around the world. It never existed. Next one. Take a look at the stadium here. Now, can you folks see, if you look at the stadium towards the back, that there were three sets of um, two giant pillars standing there? Can you folks see what I'm talking about? Okay. Believe it or not, what you're looking at, and I'll show it to you, is a very ancient occult symbol. You need this symbol or the hexagram if you're going to call upon a demon to be brought to this plane of existence. Now let's take a look at the symbol itself. You see the one on the left? You see how, a, how it has a triangle in the center and the circles on the outside? Yeah. Well, there are those who state, depending on how you want to look at it, and um, if you look at the one on the right, the circles on the inside, the triangles on the out, right? Now that particular photo I have because it was taken at a place where a person was possessed and well eventually the person was delivered but this is little thing was burnt into the wall. Oh you should see some of the photos I've got. <laughs> but I'm just showing you um, this one here because of what had happened. Now if we take that photo and compare it to the Olympic Stadium, isn't, isn't that just a giant st um, symbol? That's exactly what they're doing here. When Hitler was invoking those um, departed souls, he was actually calling upon demonic forces. That's what was going on when these new Illuminati occult elements were being introduced into the Olympic Games. Next one. <clears throat> now, let's take a, a good look at the 1936 game and compare it to the 1996 game. Well, Berlin, Germany on the left, well, they had the um, ancient high priests with the um, priestess of Hera. And if you look at the 1996 one, that's what they had. Let's go back and see what um, was going on in Germany again. No, 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 go forward. You look at the left-hand side, there's the very first high priestess of Hera because it never existed. But these were put into the Olympic Games because the Illuminati was beginning an infiltration process here. And of course, on the right-hand side, you have Eno Menengaki, um, 1996, as the high priestess of Hera. The next one, here we have the invocation on the left-hand side of Apollo, 1936. And once again, as we've already gone and reviewed before, the invocation of Apollo, 1996. Let's go further. Here we have 1936, the Berlin Nazi Games. You have the procession of the priestess. On the right-hand side, again, the 1996 procession. These things are all coming from Nazi Germany. They never existed, folks. We're just accepting it and thinking, oh, this has always been. That's our problem. We don't question things anymore. Next one. Here we have Fritz Schilgen, who represented Prometheus as he brought the fire to the Olympic bowl. And here we have Muhammad Ali, even though he was very badly in the state of um, Parkinson's disease, 
He represented Prometheus in the 1996 game. Now, of course, neither one of them knew the occult significance of what they were doing, but this is what was going on. The pictures don't lie. And the thing is, as it says, this was never part of the original Olympic Games. These occult elements were added later through the Illuminati. And, of course, there's the Olympic Bowl, left-hand side in Nazi Germany, and now we have the Olympic Cauldron. Um, look at on the right-hand side. This is a story where, as I said, you will see where the goddess brought the hidden occult knowledge through a torch and lit, you know, and the fire went throughout the world. Well, over here on the right-hand side, that's exactly what's going on with the Olympic cauldron because aren't representatives from the entire world there? Same thing, ladies and gentlemen. Next one. Um... The um, Pillars of Hercules, we talked about Nazi Germany, 1936. Um, the Pillars of Hercules is located in Centennial Park now, in Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia. They put them there. Same thing. Next one. The Olympic Bell, 1936. Um, 19, I mean, 1936. One on the right. There it is, the Olympic Bell again, 1996. These things aren't changing. The story is, next one, that's it, ah, how much do I have time, how much time do I have left? Good. Um, the Olympic Games since 1996, ever since that time, the Illuminati has really been ramping up the occultic part of the Olympic Games, you see? How many of you, obvious, well, how many of you saw the opening of the last Olympic Games, 2012 London? How many of you saw that one? Wasn't that one interesting? And then, of course, the closing one. I mean, how bizarre is this getting? Well, that's what everyone is thinking. It makes no sense to you, does it? But you see, there's actually a giant story that began in 1996. You see, first, they put all the elements of the Illuminati, um, well, I should say some of the elements of the Illuminati religion into the Olympic Games in 1936 because one of their greatest puppets, Adolf Hitler, was a German chancellor, and he did what he was told. Well, we bring it up to 1996 now, and there's an old story that you have to follow. You see, the Olympic Games are separated every year by four years, correct? Okay, it's like watching a bad soap opera. You watch it on Monday, come back three weeks later, and you can pick it up pretty much where you left off. You know, nothing happens. It's the same thing with the Olympic Games. It's a giant story that you have to start looking at in 1996. Now, because I am, I know, cl close running out of time, let me tell you basically what this story involves. The, the um, Illuminati, through these games, are telling you that the serpent god is coming back. And that the ancient gods also are going to accompany him. Oh, yeah. Next year, watch for something in a serpentine symbol. Something like that is what you're looking for. This is going to tell you the story is continuing. Now, I am working right now on trying to complete um, volume two in a new DVD, which I gave to Linda K. there. I promised her I would give her an exclusive for this. No one else has any of these DVDs. No one. And um, volume one is, has been completed. There's a lot more, obviously, to this story. It's all in that, um, those two DVDs that's back there. Volume two, I am presently working on. I am trying to finish it. I will try to get it done so that it's through post-production and everything else, blah, 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 you know. In the next three months, I will try to get it done by then. And, of course, once it is, 
Just call up Linda K. Don't call me. Because I am busy. <laughs> but anyways, but what you're going to be looking for in this next game, one big major clue, look for a serpentine symbol. How many of you remember, by any act of God, the 2000 Olympic Australian Games in Sydney, Australia? Anyone remember that? Of course not. <sighs> okay. Don't raise your hand. I know you're lying. <laughs> yeah, I know that guy. <laughs> no. Um, if you look at the way it was drawn, the Olympic um, symbol, um, their logo, look at the top. There was a serpentine um, figure there. Last year, if any of you took a good look at the um, center of the Olympic um, Stadium in London, it was a giant serpent that ran from one end to the other. Look at it. Look at it. These symbols are there for occult reasons. Now, where it was located was where, um, how many people know what Greenwich Mean Time is? You know, where we used to measure, you know, all time. It's located in London. Was, because the stadium was built on it. See, this created what's known, occultically speaking, as a crossroads. All crossroads are sacred. This one is a crossroad in time. They are calling upon the ancient serpent god to come back. And if you notice, at the top of the stadium was nothing but giant capstones ringing all the way around. And if you look in the center, you could see, um, oops, you could see the um, pupils. This is the capstone of the Illuminati that ringed the entire stadium at the top. How many of you saw that? You saw that one, right? Want another one? Anyone else? My goodness. Uh, it's kind of old? Oval. Yeah, it's more circular than oval than anything else. I know what you're talking about. But the thing is, it was at Greenwich Mean Time where they used to measure um, time itself for the rest of the world. But watch for a serpentine figure. I've got a lot more to tell. But as I said, um, I can't do it obviously now. I'm limited to time. But those two DVDs, three and a half hours long. There's a lot to tell what happened from then. And we can only just barely begin to scratch the surface now. Because I still have to write out the rest of it, which is going to be another three and a half, four hours. This is an old, very old occult story that the Illuminati has been using to slowly ingrain all you people, whether you realize it or not, into preparing for the arrival of the serpent god. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, I know I'm just about out of time. Linda, sweetheart, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Interesting. Yes. Uh, how many of y'all know Doc? Do you know his background? Do you know that he's an ex-Illuminati? Yeah. Do you know that he was a witch? Yeah. So if anybody is very much on top of the Illuminati, Doc is. So if you have any questions about anything, any of his DVDs or whatever, please feel free to go back there to his table and surround him. <laughs> Thank you. God bless. Y'all have a wonderful supper, and we'll see you back here at 7 o'clock. Bye.